Founders face mentors and masters. I'm Captain Hawk, CEO of Founders Space, the leading global startup accelerator. I'm also author of the award-winning books, Make Elephants Fly, Surviving a Startup, and The Five Forces. Today, I am with Alex Chomp the co-founder of the Mentors Collective and Evolution Accelerator. Now, for everybody who doesn't already know Alex, he is a wonderful guy, always so giving. He could teach a whole course on how to develop really close relationships and support people. So Alex, I am so happy to have you here. It is good to be here. When you came up with this idea for the Mentors Collective, what inspired you? Like, what was the first thing when you saw a glimpse of why you would do this and why it's necessary. I'm actually a, a California native and um, I come from a family of entrepreneurs and my father still has a portfolio of patents in the telecommunications space. And so I, I grew up in, in a world of entrepreneurial desire and ability. And I was the kid who had multiple paper routes and washed dishes everywhere. I took a break from computing in 1991 to join the Marine Corps. And uh, while I was there, I, I guarded nuclear weapons, and then I guarded United Nations personnel, spent a little bit of time in Guantanamo. And uh, when I got home in 1995, well, that was the, the, the boom, boom time, right? That was it. So my wife and I moved to Silicon Valley, and I had the pleasure of working for the largest venture capital firm in the world as their director of technology. That was at the height of the dot-com boom. And uh, oh my gosh, was I hooked. Oh, wow. I couldn't get enough of it. And so after my kids were born, I have, I have five kids and we're grown up a little bit so that uh, mom didn't need me around all the time or, or want me around all the time. I started a software company and that software company today is the premier risk management platform for cannabis banking in the United States. Uh, very pleased to have co-founded that company with, together with Jonte James in 2017. Around the same time, I created my first crypto fund and I was really lucky because Jonathan Allen of Decrypt Capital is our fund manager because we are lucky to have him as our friend. And for those of you who don't know Jonathan Allen of Decrypt Capital, gosh, he's got to be one of the top guys in the world on the technology. So I've been really excited about blockchain and crypto ever since it came out. I got into it professionally in 2017. About 120 days ago, a friend of mine, Hayden Spillman, who is the first artist of the collective and my co-founder, he uh, minted his first NFT. And I got on the phone to him. It was Saturday morning. And I'm like, hey, Hayden, check it out, man. Do you need a business manager? And he's like, oh, yeah, Al, I totally need a business manager. I said, okay, Hey, cool. And then like three days later, I was like, hey, if Hayden needs one of these, everybody needs one of these. And so we put it together in a couple of days, called a few friends and stacked up the seed funding, took from Monday to Thursday, called the August Stoll Reeves on Friday, had the Delaware C filed on Monday. I think we're at day 113 now. This is just the uh, next step in a lifetime of exciting projects. I, I love doing this, Captain Hoff. This is my uh, passion. I like to strap on the tennies and show the team every now and then that we have, we still have what it takes. And to be able to do it in support of the larger goal, which is to create ownership for you know, the people of the world, the creators of the world. That is a, a project that I want to be part of. Talk about a perfect public company. Talk about a real a realization of something that is good that everybody can get behind. Who doesn't want to see creators be compensated for their creations? So you, the Mentors Collective was born out of your accelerator. Generally speaking, the collective is here to help artists, creatives of all type, creators of all type to experience access to this exciting new market that um, is in the digital space that was $2 billion in volume in the last 90 days. And, and that's as part of a larger $2.5 trillion market in the blockchain world. So there's some pretty exciting growth. In the last uh, measurement that I read, this market space, uh, the NFT market space was growing 20x every 90 days where the uh, larger uh, blockchain currency space was growing at 2x every 90 days. So this is a very, very fast growing market. It's very exciting to be here. And we think it represents an even better opportunity to create ownership for everybody 
anybody. You don't now, now you don't have to be a classic entrepreneur with an invention. You can be an artist. You can be a creator. You can be a script writer or a set designer or a photographer. You can be a poet. You can be a sports individual. We even see opportunities here for philanthropy and gosh, there are just too many things to list. Yes. So for those of you who don't know what NFTs are, they are basically your ability to move intellectual property onto the blockchain and own it. Alex, do you want to just give a few sentence elaboration on that? I'm, I'm really glad to hear you put it that way, Captain, because honestly, I speak to so many people who are focused on the art piece and they miss the larger story, which is intellectual property. And, and let's just pause for a moment here and think about the largest asset class in the world. Okay. You, you could argue that it's real estate, but I would actually argue that it's intellectual property. Intellectual property is, wow, it is a tremendous fantastic, humongous asset that belongs to all of us. And the the rules of intellectual property are essentially 200 or more years old. They live in things called patents and copyrights and trademarks, which are great and valid and continue to be the basis and the bedrock of a lot of the commercial opportunities that define greatness inside of the capital sphere. But there is an opportunity here through the magic of blockchain, through the the magic of a non-fungible token, an NFT, to create and and encapsulate and tag unique, specific items and to commercialize those items using the same principles as existing intellectual property. And you could elect to take advantage of non-fungible tokens in the blockchain world. And for about the price of a hamburger lunch, get your intellectual property disclosed and owned and put it into a marketplace and create an opportunity for individuals who are moved by your creative expression to exchange value, tokens of value with you in return for the right to say that they own a copy of and and can display your creative arts. And creative arts here are very broadly defined. Here we see that LeBron James, who is a sports star through the vehicle of NBA Top Shots, and uh, through the, the magic of Visa, has dedicated a slam dunk to the late, great Kobe Bryant. And that slam dunk has um, been valued at $400,000 in opening. So that's a, it's a digital image. NBA is not giving away the image. LeBron James is not giving away the image. They're, they're created a limited number of copies, which will be available for display in the digital world. Here, we think virtual reality is coming fast, and it's very, very exciting. You could see um, Jack Dorsey uh, took his first tweet and encapsulated it on the blockchain as a non-fungible token. Uh, I think, was that two and a half million that that sold for? It was about that. I think it's very important our audience understand this. There is a difference between a non-fungible token and legal ownership of intellectual property. If you have written a book, if you've written a screenplay, if you've you know created any sort of content, you can copyright that. And the copyright expenses, if you know what you're doing, if you go on uspto.gov, they aren't that expensive, but you have legal ownership within our court system. You go to NFTs, they're a different beast entirely. You may have ownership that people grant you under the terms of the NFT, but it may not be the ownership that a lot of people think it is. So like the buyer doesn't really own that intellectual piece of property. In a way, they are licensing it for use, for example, within a game like NBA Top Shot. You know, they could use that in the game, but they aren't really allowed to use it in any other way. And in fact, the NBA made it clear that if they use it in a way that NBA doesn't deem appropriate, they can retract that even though they paid money for it. So we're at the very beginning stages of NFTs as far as I see it. At some point, these two have to come together. The legal side of it, you know, our whole court system, intellectual property law, all of that has to merge at some point with this new type of digital asset. And what do you see coming? The rights that are accompany a non-fungible token uh, vary from token to token. Here we get into a concept called the smart contract. And the smart contract is probably the real magic of blockchain. Smart contracts are are self-executing pieces of software that are, in this case, agreements between parties and counterparties as to what's being transferred that has value and what rights will accompany that intellectual property. So to your point, NBA Top Shots most certainly does not give away 
the right to do anything you want with their art. Although an artist might choose to transfer copyright or to allow the subsequent owner through the magic of a smart contract to have creative license with the works that they then purchase. The beauty of a smart contract is that it's quite flexible in that regard. It can be as simple or as complicated as any contract in the real world. To your larger point, there is a convergence because common law and uh, understanding about commercial value and the court systems are not going to throw out the existing concepts around intellectual property. At the same time, the blockchain does afford artists some capabilities that traditional copyright simply does not. Probably the most important of those is the ability to earn residual income on the resale of your art in perpetuity. So what that means in practical terms is that if I have a unique piece of art, which I create an NFT for, and I, let's say, create 100 non-fungible tokens, each referencing this original piece of art, and I assign one of those tokens to you, Captain Hoff, you may elect later on when the token increases in value, either because of maybe something that's happened to me or something that's happened to my body of work, you may elect to sell that token on for whatever reason. And at that time, a smart contract will allow me to be paid automatically and instantly a residual on that resale. So that concept can be extended to songs playing on the radio. So today you have a very important set of intermediaries who hold trust relationships between creators and utilizers of art. And, you know, do you remember how the um, internet disintermediated or disintegrated the Im intermediate layer that we used to call travel agents and bookstores by solving the problem of information and access? But the internet never solved the problem of trust. Matter of fact, trust became a bigger problem on the internet. So while I can use the internet to buy a ticket from Southwest Airlines, because I trust Southwest Airlines to deliver me safely to my location without the intermediary of a travel agent, I can't trust someone selling me intellectual property, that that intellectual property is authenticated and truly unique and that I have the rights that I think I do to it. It's very, very difficult to know that that's true. Blockchain largely works on solving problems related to trust, if you want it to be very general about it. And so the, the magic of the blockchain as it came about in 2008 and, and as evidenced by Bitcoin and Ethereum and another of a number of other cryptocurrencies is that you can live in a kind of trustless place without the intermediate services of, let's say, a central bank. So you can disintermediate central banks in cryptocurrencies. At least that's the dream. The idea here is to disintermediate the players in the intellectual property space. And there are a lot of them. So I think it's exciting and interesting. Again, it's the largest asset class in the world, human creativity. And it's having its boundaries of commercialization redrawn for the first time in over a century. I'm, I'm excited to be there, I'm excited to be first. <laughs> with um, the world's first artist collective. And we're here to help artists, you know, get through that on-ramp and then really maximize the value of their creations. And then of course, comply with some pretty rigorous tax requirements as well as take advantage of intellectual property as it stands today. My understanding, when I look at NFTs and the blockchain and intellectual property law is that they are really two different things. So. One does not replace the other. And for the foreseeable future, I don't see that happening because one is all about law, the laws we have a past, and the other, the NFTs and blockchain is a mechanism, a system for basically digitizing intellectual property and then putting it out there, controlling distribution, monetizing it. Like you say, you can collect with a copyright if I do a deal for music or I do a deal for a television show, I can collect residuals. I can do it. The blockchain, though, makes it much more efficient in the digital world. That's really the transformation we're seeing. It, it makes it very simple for you to get something up there. And with smart contracts, you have a global business. Like you can put your artwork, you can put your comic strip, whatever you create out to the world, you can control all sorts of different variables in it. You know, how many times can people copy it? And when, mm -hmm. and when they copy it, what can they do with it? And when they sell it, do you get something back for each of those sales? So that is revolutionary. I think yeah. uh, it is going to be amazing to see how NFTs evolve. And it will be really important, though, 
to link those NFTs back to copyright law. So I would encourage every artist out there, every creator out there, do both. Copyright, yes. it's super easy. You can do it yourself. You don't need a lawyer. And then you go create an NFT. So if the artist is creating an NFT, that is when they come to you. Because I know a lot of artists all over the world, a lot in the Bay, San Francisco Bay Area, where, which is my home. And they really don't understand NFTs. It is confusing to them. They want to participate in this. They don't know how it works. So explain what you do in assisting these artists to get their content, their intellectual property digitized and monetized. So at a basic level, what we have found um, in the last 100 and some odd days since we came into existence is that about 80% of the artists that we speak to or the creatives that we've spoken to, and we've spoken to over 100 at this point, and we speak to more every day, they have heard of NFTs. They've heard of non-fungible tokens. It's reached their consciousness somehow that people are selling digital art for amounts of money that seem very, very desirable to your everyday run-of-the-mill artist and creator who might otherwise have to have another job to support their passion, which is the creation of art or artistic endeavors. So we find that there's a, a large number of people who recognize the technology. We find that uh, none or almost none of them have actually created an NFT. And when they join our program, the first thing we do is talk to them about their experience level and just get a sense of where it is they are on the, the journey. Let's call it from one to 10. And we find generally people are around step two or three. They've heard of it. They're favorably inclined toward it but they don't know what to do. So then we take them through a very guided process. It doesn't take too, too long. You know, it's the creation of a wallet, first of all. So we find that most people have not created a wallet. And we use a program that's widely available to do that. And we walk people through the creation of a wallet. And then we show them how to load that wallet with some Ethereum so that they'll be able to pay for the computational costs or, or gas fees, which will re be required to mint their art. Then assuming that they have chosen the first piece that they would like to mint, and if they haven't, then we help them to curate their collection and really talk about some strategies for maximizing the value of their art. Our first artist estimates that we increased the value of his art by 10x at point of sale through the use of certain strategies related to smart contracts. But anyway, we talk about strategy and then we walk you through the process of actually uploading your first piece of art. And then there's a fair amount of descriptive data. Technically, you could call it metadata that surrounds this piece of art. Like what's it going to be titled and how many copies are going to be permitted and what, if any, residuals will be paid and to whom and you know, will the copyright be transferred, et cetera, et cetera. There are a series of questions and checklists that you have to go through. And it's not terribly difficult. It can take 10 to 15 minutes if you know what you're doing for a piece. It's a little bit like creating a corporation on LegalZoom. It's easy enough to do. Anyone can do it, but it helps to have somebody guide you through some of the questions. When an artist comes to you, you help them get their artwork up there, which is great because yes. I know a lot of artists that need this help. But my question to you is, what's your business model? How do oh, you right. make money sure. with your company? Sure. Well, we do more than that, of course. Getting people into the NFT space is just the first step. We're really here to help create additional value for the artists. So we, for example, will help to amplify their marketing message. We will help to identify potential collectors and strategies for growth. Every time you sell 100 tokens, you create somewhere between 300 and 500 tax events, which you're going to be responsible for being able to figure out on December 31st of this year. So we'll give you access to our intellectual property that is only one of its kind right now that will automatically calculate your business returns as well as your, your tax load. You know, there are some even more complicated things you can go down that road. If you want to um, do different things with your art, we're here to help you. The, the collective is here to help the artist. Now, in terms of how we make money, we ask for a percentage of the gross sale. And then that percentage is put into the collective's funds. And then the collective spends that money on behalf of all of the artists. So our single largest spending category is on amplification of artists, marketing for artists, blowing artists up, creating a story around artists that's really going to drive their value and increase the knowledge that people have of them in the space. Because once again, this is the 
probably the fastest growing market space in the world right now. It's growing at 20x every 90 days. I'm not sure that anything is growing faster than that. It's a much better use case for blockchain, by the way, than crypto is. It'll grow up to at least the size of crypto, which means this market has a thousand X left to grow. But in any case, um, what we find is that artists are not only intimidated by the process of getting online, they also generally don't know how to run their own businesses or don't care to run their own businesses. They don't necessarily run or run their own social media accounts. They may not be interested in finding a CPA that works for them, et cetera, et cetera. So these are things that we're doing to help artists to become not just successful, not just commercially viable, not just increase sales, but also successful artists who take more home. Because remember, What's the whole point? The whole point is to increase ownership. That's why we are around. That's that's what motivates us. That's what gets us up in the morning is the knowledge that ownership is the cure for society's ills, or at least one of them. And the Mentors Collective can help create ownership for an even larger class of individuals than are normally considered entrepreneurs. The, the number of creatives in the world is actually quite large. And to be able to create ownership for those individuals and give them the ability to, to have wealth and to affect their communities and their families in the ways that they would like to see and to create legacies of their own, that's extremely exciting. That gets me up every morning. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you liked it, hit the subscribe button and share it with your friends. You can help us create more great content by subscribing and sharing. Also, if you want to access our online startup program, our investor network, and our entrepreneur resources, just come to founderspace.com.